Oh, we have to take in refugees. Oh, we're humanitarians. Oh, we owe it to the world. No, we don't. Not when we're bankrupt. The nation is bankrupt, in case you haven't checked lately. Obama has bankrupted America. He inherited a $1 trillion debt. It's now, what, $5 trillion? He printed money. Now, where's the money to come from to take care of all of these masses? Where? Now, many of you will say I'm being overly harsh, and we're supposed to take in our poor and our hungry and the huddled masses, and I'm a son of an immigrant. I have all people should know that. Let me give you the lesson again. You must have missed it this summer and last spring because I gave it to you several times. Oh, give us your tired, your poor, and your hungry masses. That's right on our Statue of Liberty, isn't it? And when was that posted on the sta uh, engraved on the Statue of Liberty? Well, when the Statue of Liberty was put up around 1900, 1904, I don't know when. Was there a welfare state then? No. Were refugees given welfare? No. Food stamps? No. Check no, the no box. Were refugees permitted to vote the minute they got here? Check no on the no box. No. So we say, give us your tired, your poor, and hungry masses. And one of the reasons we believed in that is because we needed factory labor. America's economy was booming. So once again, they used liberal platitudes to sway the public into accepting masses of refugees from uh, Italy, Germany, Jewish refugees. They came into work like dogs in factories to break their backs, building roads, building uh, buildings, to work in the needle trades. They needed uh, hundreds of thousands of them to work like slaves in the, in the garment center. Give us your tired, your poor, and hungry masses. So they would work in the factories. Do we don't need factory workers right now. Obama gutted the factories. Clinton started by exporting the factories, and Obama more or less finished it off. So no, it's no longer give us your tired, your poor, and your hungry masses. Not with a welfare state. So I made my point. 855 two, two topics. The U.S. to take in at least 10,000 Syrian refugees, according to Obama. He hasn't gone to Congress yet, but they don't count to him. He doesn't really see it as an American issue. He's sort of the Ayatollah of America whatever he wants. And then the issue with the Iran deal. And by the way, it's no guarantee that it's going to go through. You know why? The Iranians may reject it. <laughs> you see, this is the odd part. We're screaming and yelling here, sound and fury, meeting yesterday in Washington, Ted Cruz, Trump, whatever. Great. I'm glad they did it. That's a good thing. But the real game changer is what the Iranian so-called parliament is, parliament is going to do. They may reject it entirely because we're insisting that they're insisting all sanctions come off before the deal starts. And we're saying the opposite. And so they may actually reject it before we do. Do you know that? Isn't that an odd co a coincidence? A paradox, rather. That a fascist dictatorship may reject the deal before our so-called democracy does. Think about it. I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. This vote is the most serious that I've taken in a number of years. This, and the reason for that is that it'll be irrevocable. This vote has monumental and enduring, enduring consequences. Throughout my review of this deal, my questions have always been, how does it deal with the safety and security of the United States, and how does it deal with the safety, security, and viability of the state of Israel? And what's the answer? That's, uh, that's Mikulski. Did she answer it, or she just asked the question? Uh, obviously, she stands with Obama on this, because whatever he says goes, he pressed the iron boot on the neck. <clears throat> That's the whole story. By the way, your friends at the New York Times have launched a new website called Jew Tracker. The descendants of Jews, Sulzberger, has now produced the equivalent of a newspaper from Germany in the 1930s under Adolf Hitler. A new list in the New York Times run by Sulzberger's insane grandson lists lawmakers and whether they're Jewish and how many Jewish constituents they represent. This is something you would have seen in the 1930s in Germany. And this is what happens uh, when you have a mentally disordered individual running a newspaper. 
Uh, I wonder if they would do this um, on another deal and ask about Muslim tracker, asking whether lawmakers are Muslim and how many Muslim constituents they represent. I don't know if Sulzberger would consider that. The online chart published by these insane liberals tracks whether lawmakers who oppose the deal with Iran are Jewish. And the teach the t- the article is entitled "Lawmakers Against the Iran Nuclear Deal." And then, if you look at the chart put out by the Sulzberger family, Democrats against the deal. Jewish? Question mark. Charles Schumer, Zieg Heil, yes. Benjamin Cardin, check, yes. Robert Menendez, Jewish, no. Joe Manchin, no. Schumer, New York State, nine point one percent Jewish population above the 2.2% U.S. average. They haven't really worked out. They would have been very good statisticians in the Third Reich. I don't know how they get such data. It's really interesting how good they are at at data analysis at the New York Times when they want to be. I'll tell you that. They know what percent of the population is Jewish everywhere. How do they know that? I don't know why they didn't complete this article by uh, putting a six-pointed yellow badge next to every Jewish opponent of the sellout with Iran. They could have shown Schumer with a yellow a yellow star, Cardin with a yellow star, Menendez with a yellow star, Manchin with a yellow star. They could have given an honorary yellow star to, uh, to Senator Cruz. They could have put a yellow star on all the Republicans. Then they would have completed their work. Liberalism is a mental disorder. Do you know that or not? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The, the time when this came, in 2001 and 2008, each time, not just once, but each time, you have the greatest collapse. Now, it could happen around that time, and I'm not dogmatic that it has to happen, you know, every time at that time. Uh, nothing has to happen. However, if we go by this, I would, the last seven cycles of this, there has been a collapse every time. And it's not just the economic realm or financial realm. This, you know, there's a thing in the book called the mystery, the rise and fall of nations. It also is, is linked to the times of global shakings, uh, like, for instance, World War II, the cycle 9-11 comes at that peak last week of the Shemitah. Um, and so it's not only that, it can also touch other realms. And again, as the Hebrew means shake. Wait, so like this Iran sellout, the deal of the nuclear deal with Iran, would you say this fits in? To- totally. I mean, I mean, Obama gave the, gave the Congress, he said, you know, two months to pass this deal. Well, that comes right to this time, right in September. There are so many things that are converging at this time. So, I w- yes, you have wars. I mean, there, there is also there is a, uh, what's called a super cycle of this, and that is that when this happens seven times, you have every single time you have war in the Middle East, you have a major war concerning Israel, and, you know, major events, and now that cycle is also converging as well. So, yeah, everything is really converging. Converging and, and though we're not dogmatic, I would say be ready because this thing has been so consistent, and it's, it could be shakings in the financial realm, shakings in world history, shakings even in the natural realm. So well, you, why, why wait, before we, before we take our break and come back to you, Jonathan? Why is this coming? And who made these predictions? I don't follow that. Okay. Well, this is this is the actual cycle that is ordained. This is you find it for the first time in the. Torah, you find this in from Moses. Actually, Moses is the first one. This is where it's set, and so this got this pattern and this cycle. And even people on Wall Street. I mean, after I wrote the book, I got contacted. They said, "Yes, we've seen that seven years ago, but we didn't know anything about the Shemitah." But what they identified is actually at the time, not just seven-year cycle, but at the time of the biblical Shemitah. Wait. So you're telling me everything is preordained? Well, no, I'm not saying. Well, there is the. There, what I'm saying is this. There are patterns, and there are cycles, and there is phenomena. And it's not that it's the only one. Like, one of the things I noticed, Michael, one, is that one of the things that the Shemitah deals with is debt. And, when, and the strongest time, sometimes years the cycle is stronger, sometimes less. But at the times when the debt level in America has been the highest, that's the 1930s, and then from the 1970s till now, that is when this thing has been the absolute strongest. So there are there are the number of factors one of them is this so it's not that everything has to be and that's why we had a we had a shake in the stock market about 10 days ago that shook everyone to their core 
And then the big boys came in and manipulated it again, took some profit, bought it low, sold it again. You think they're playing with the market, or what's going on here? Well, if people are, yeah, I think people are always playing with the market. My, but the interesting thing is that what happened is this suddenly started destabilizing when? As we, we're approaching the climactic time. There's a pattern. The general pattern of the Shemitah is that when it begins, it's, not, it's kind of mild. But when you reach, See, if it's going to matter. Here's my, Jonathan, I believe that what you wrote is, is interesting, but I'm not into, into this prediction. I, I mean, I don't believe that the Bible predicted everything that's going to happen. I really don't. These are not prophecies. These, this, is the, this is the cycle and patterns. It's a little different. It's not saying that something has to happen, but it is saying that, you know, if you see, if you're getting a, a weather report. Well, we are in a cycle where everything is coming to a head. Russia moves troops into Syria against uh, Obama's uh, protestations. They're putting the biggest nuclear submarine in the world moves into Syria. Something's going to happen over there. This is no joke. We got Russia moving. We got a flood of humanitarian uh, refugee uh, crisis like we've never seen since World War II. We got an economy that's about to blow out. Things are happening, aren't they? Exactly. And if you look, Michael, it, it's you see the pattern is that you get this breakdown. You know, I said one of the one of the meanings of this thing is collapse. And the thing is that you're watching a breakdown. You're watching convergences. And you know, I'll tell you what we'll do, Jonathan. Give us the name of your book again because we we want the audience to know, Jonathan. Please tell us the book. Yeah, it's the mystery of the Shemitah, and it's available everywhere. Okay. Jonathan's going to come back for a very short segment. I don't even know if we'll have the time. We'll take one or two calls from the listeners, 855-407-282. Jonathan, I'll be right back, and everyone else. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Ladies and gentlemen, all the sound and fury signifying nothing, the Republican Party. The dictator has spoken. The will of the people be damned, the will of Congress be damned, common sense be damned, national security be damned. The Fuhrer has spoken. The thin man has spoken, and he got what he wants. All the sound and fury signifying nothing. And now the man in charge of everything, the man who runs it like an Ayatollah, wants to take in at least 10,000 Syrian refugees. Again, Congress be damned. He's running the country like a banana republic that he owns in the back of his pocket. How is that possible? How does he get away with it? Why is he not opposed? How does he own McConnell and Boehner? How is this even possible? How could our culture accept a dictator who has emerged in our, in our time? You know and I know. You know and I know if a Republican was behaving this way, there'd be screams from the psychotics in the press for impeachment. You know and I know that the lunatics at the New York Times would be screaming day and night about an impeachment and would have been for years now if it was a Republican doing what this character is doing. It was just politics as usual. We'd say, who cares? I would talk about other things. I would talk about fish oils right now. Or I would talk about anything, but anything you want. But this is such an important vote. The Iran deal. I love Iran deal. Senate Dems block GOP measure to kill Iran deal. I get so angry when I see the word deal. These lowlifes who couldn't run a hot dog stand think that they're big deal makers because they're dealing with your money. Deal, they call it. Deal. A big deal. We worked out a deal. A deal. These people that would take $1,200 under the table or 12 free pizzas for their office. If they could, if they get 12 free pizzas, they vote for the Iran deal. Most of these schnurrers. Deal. Big deal makers. You put them in the private sector, they couldn't run a, a McDonald's properly. And I mean, it's easy, it's very easy to understand how hard that is to do right. You know how hard it is to run a McDonald's franchise? I can guarantee you John Kerry could not run a McDonald's franchise. If this man was stripped of his loudmouth position, and he was told, you're no longer a government worker, you're going to have to run a McDonald's in Dearborn, Michigan, the, the business would be out of business in two weeks. He'd have to manage staff. He'd have to talk to the staff. He'd have to balance the books. He'd have to buy the supplies. He'd have to turn the electricity on. These people don't know very much about the real world, and they're the ones negotiating with these, these murderers from Iran. Look at Obama. Has he ever held a job in his life? Has Obama ever held a job in his life? Did he ever wash a dish like I did? Was he a dishwasher when he was 14 years old? 
Did he ever work as a busboy till 2 o'clock in the morning like I did to pay his bills? 